Welcome to the Proton Guru video practice for topic 4.1. These problems will give you practice on pi conjugation and identifying how this stabilizes a molecule. Some brief and straightforward reading to get you ready for these kinds of problems can be found in the Organic Chemistry 2 primer by Dr. Hujiri and co-authors. You can find additional videos and ways to match up those videos with the chapters in whatever textbook you're using for your course at protonguru.com. There are several types of problems in which our knowledge of pi conjugation and its influence on stability might be employed. Here's an example of one type of problem. Provide a representation of 1,3-butadiene that includes a, the orbitals involved in pi bonding, and b, a drawing of the resonance hybrid. In order to address this problem, we first have to draw a line bond structure of 1,3-butadiene, shown here. We next need to understand what orbitals are used to make pi bonds in general and a pi bond is formed by the overlap of two p orbitals on adjacent atoms. So two p orbitals should be present here and here in our 1,3-butadiene if we're thinking on our scratch paper about how the pi bonds might look in terms of their orbital composition. So the pi bonding orbitals in 1,3-butadiene should look like this picture here. And this emphasizes how pi conjugation works, really that you have the ability to spread the electrons across this entire pi system in the molecule. Now let's look at part B of this problem where we are asked to draw resonance hybrid structure for 1,3-butadiene. Well, the first thing we have to do is start off with the 1,3-butadiene itself and draw the resonance contributors so that from those contributors we can deduce what the hybrid would be. There are a couple of resonance contributors we can draw. We can move the pi bonds in this way, and that would move a negative charge to this carbon here. You'd be left with a positive charge on this carbon here, and you'd have a new pi bond between these two carbons. It can be helpful to confirm the validity of this as a resonance contributor by filling in the hydrogens and lone pairs. When we move a pi bond pair of electrons onto this carbon in our arrows we use to figure out the resonance contributors, that pair of electrons is now sitting on that carbon. When you're drawing resonance contributors, you can't move any sigma bonds, so the number of hydrogens on each of the carbons in the structure must remain constant. Now we can just as easily draw another resonance contributor where we move the electrons in the opposite direction towards the right instead of towards the left. If we do that, we will produce a pi bond between these two carbons due to that arrow, pushing electrons into that space, and we will leave a positive charge on this carbon and pushing a lone pair onto this carbon will leave a negative charge there. The resonance hybrid has to comprise all of the information of all of the resonance contributors we've just figured out. So you draw these dashed lines to indicate partial occupancy of bonds in those positions. You see in one resonance contributor there's a double bond here, but in a couple of the other ones there is not a double bond in that position. We indicate that partial occupancy of a double bond character by that dashed line. And in some of the resonance contributors, we have a pi bond between the middle carbons. So we need a dotted line in that position to indicate that. And the same thing for this area at the end. There is a double bond, pi bond character in one of the resonance contributors, but not in the others. So the proper resonance hybrid would look like this. You also have to figure out what the charges would be. Now, there aren't any partial charges in this middle structure, which we started with. And on the left-hand carbon, there's a positive charge in one resonance contributor and a negative charge in the other. So overall, those will cancel each other out. Same for the right-hand carbon, and you won't have any partial charges on the carbons in this structure. Much of this lesson is about how pi conjugation contributes to the stability of alkenes. So naturally, one type of question that you might be asked in terms of pi conjugation will be to rank alkenes in terms of stability, as we see here. Now, since this question focuses on the alkenes, you want to highlight those double bond areas of the molecule because you're really only looking at the alkenes and figuring out their relative stability. You can see that each of these molecules has two pi bonds in its structure. In the primer lesson, we learned about three different types of alkenes, isolated, pi conjugated, and cumulated. And each of these has a different ramification on the stability. So we should highlight these pi conjugated isolated and accumulated areas of alkene functional groups in these molecules. With this information in hand, it's very easy to identify number one, the most stable, the pi conjugated, and number four, the least stable, the accumulated alkene structure. What about these two in the center here, which have isolated alkene units? 
Well, now we have to think back to some things we learned in organic chemistry one, that the more substituted alkenes are more stable. So if we look at the alkenes in this case, we see that this alkene has two non-hydrogen substituents here and here, and so does this one. You have an alkene with two alkyl groups and two hydrogens. So we have two substituents on each of those two alkenes. If we switch our attention over to this alkene, we see that the alkene in the ring has one, two non-hydrogens coming off of the double bond carbons, and in this alkene we have one, two, three. Well, that is more substituents than we had in this other alkene on the left over here. So we should have greater stability in the more substituted alkene here. So that should be our second most stable, and that should be our third most stable. Now a knowledge that pi conjugated alkenes are more stable than our isolate alkenes also has ramifications for identifying the major product of reactions. Even reactions that we've learned in organic chemistry one quite a bit of time ago, such as the E2 reaction. If we consider the reaction of this substrate, for example, with potassium t-butoxide, a bulky base that's very good at initiating E2 reactions, we have two possibilities for places where we could make the double bond in the elimination reaction. It could be here or here. Now, from organic chemistry one, we would try to use the Zaitsev's rule that, well, when you do an elimination reaction, you should make the most stable alkene. And in organic chemistry one, we would look at this and say, well, this is a di-substitute alkene, and so is this. So without any knowledge of pi conjugation, we might guess that they'd be equally likely to occur. But now we can see that you have a double, single, double bond, a pi conjugated segment in this product, but not in this product the product on the right has only isolated alkene units. Because of that, the pi conjugated structure possibility is the more stable, and therefore it's the major product, following the Zaitsev rule that we learned for E2 reactions last semester.